evening everybody hello hello please say hello so that i know that i'm talking to the people rather than just looking at my laptop screen <laughs> hi how's everyone going uh nice to see everyone back here again for the final session of the our whiskey virtual whiskey festival it's been such an amazing four weeks i'm just over the moon with uh, how many how many of you have come and tuned in to uh, watch our live tastings with whiskey makers from all over the world to talk you through whiskies and to taste along with them as well this has been fantastic so thank you very much uh, my name is becky paskin i'm the co-founder of our whiskey i'm a whiskey writer and a presenter and uh, I'm here to talk you through some whiskies today. So thanks so much for joining me. Um, yeah, brilliant, some comments are coming in. Hello everyone, hi, hi John, hi Dom, hi Sean, hi Liam, hi everyone. Um, as we go through the tasting today, please leave some comments on what you think about the whiskies. Uh, please also don't be afraid to ask any questions to our whiskey makers as well. They want your questions. This is what they live for. They want to talk about their whiskey. They're so passionate about it. Um, so what is the festival? So the Our Whiskey Virtual Whiskey Festival was uh, created to raise funds for the Drinks Trust charity, which helps uh, those people in the hospitality industry who may have fallen on hard times uh, at any point, and especially now during the coronavirus pandemic. So really great charity. And thank you everybody who's bought a ticket and a tasting pack of whiskies uh, for helping to contribute. Uh, on top of that, all of the brands who have been involved in the Whiskey Festival have also sponsored it so there'll be a generous donation going to charity as well um our whiskey uh the brand behind it all of which i'm a co-founder is a uh how would i describe it now we're kind of transitioning into a new phase of our life where we're in, turning into an educational platform where we want to talk about whiskey and teach everybody about whiskey in a really accessible and fun and engaging way so we're all about showcasing diversity of the people who make whiskey the people who drink whiskey and just making it a really fun interesting drink for for everybody to enjoy so virtual whiskey festival brilliant lots of lots more people saying hello hi atul hi scott Tabitha, hi again. Oh yeah, I remember you, you were here last time. <laughs> Glad you've come along even though you haven't got the samples. So thank you so much for turning up. Um, guys, I do need to have a couple of um, thank yous um, to people who have supported the festival so far. So a huge thanks to Chris Borre from the DRAM team and also to Adrian at Claxton's, our bottler, who have uh, given their time and money. They've dedicated uh, a lot of time to uh, creating those samples that you have in front of you. So thanks so much to those guys um, for everything they've done for us. Right. Um, I, I, in every single tasting pack that I send out, I put in a little handwritten note, which is a kind of clue as to what the whiskies might be that week. And I wonder if anybody has picked up on what this week's theme might be. Now, I don't have the, the card in front of me, but it was something along the lines of, um, here's a game you can play at home. Which of these whiskies will take the throne? Any ideas? Post a comment if you think. And by the way, guys, please follow us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and subscribe to us on YouTube as well. If you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe. Oh, one person's got it. Ah, here we go. All two. Hmm. Okay, that, okay, there are a couple of um, guesses, but for those of you who aren't sure about what it might be, this might be a bit of a clue. Yeah, get it now? Yes, there we go, <laughs> a few people have got it. Uh, Samantha, Stanford, she's right. Atul Fennason, yep, Akvita, yep. Miriam, you've got it right, guys. <laughs> we are indeed going to be tasting the Game of Thrones series. Woo. I'm excited. I hope you guys are excited as well, because I actually, uh, I, I think I've tasted these once before, but not for a really long time. So I'm going to be tasting them through with you. And we've got some, uh, we've got very special person with us today to uh, help talk us through everything. So I want to introduce you to uh, the one and only Ewan Gunn. Hi, Becky. Hi. Hi, Ewan. How are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. How are you doing? Grand, thanks. Yeah, I'm really well. Uh, so you and you're the global brand ambassador for Diageo on the whiskey portfolio. That's correct, yeah. 
So what does that mean? What, is that, what exactly does a global brand ambassador do? Um, the, the list is almost endless. Um, we do a range of things. We do a lot of training internally. We do a lot of events all over the world. Increasingly, we're doing a lot of virtual tastings. Um, we do a lot of sort of interaction with media, make sure people mostly say nice things about our whiskies. Um, and we, we do get involved in innovation as well. I mean, honestly, we, we kind of get pulled into a range of different sort of roles across the business. So it's a it's a job that's a lot of fun, but it's a job that's always evolving and changing as, as well. I can imagine. I can imagine you've um, tasted some amazing whiskies in some amazing places around the world. Uh, yeah, I had some I've been very fortunate. Well. <laughs> I've been very fortunate in that respect. Yes. <laughs> I remember the, the last time that we actually spoke was um, in Madrid. Um, so I, yes. We were both in, in town for the opening of the Johnny Walker store in Madrid, which was fantastic, such an, a beautiful place. And yes. um, what, was the, what was the name of the bar? We, that we were in a bar which had the best soundtrack ever. Oh. Do you remember? Yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but it was just insane music that they were playing all night long. It was absolutely brilliant, yeah. It was this oh. wicked mixture. Oh, what was it? Sa Salmon Guru, I think. Was Salmon the Guru. That was it. Yes. It was. It was Salmon Guru. And they had this wonderful mixture of um, R&B, sort of 90s hip hop, um, yeah. like indie. It was just like amazing. Like pretty drink. impressive range of neon throughout the bar as well, from what I remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, right, Ewan, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, and guys, oh my goodness, the Game of Thrones whiskies. This is so cool. Uh, I see people posting up comments in uh, whiskey groups all over social media asking if anybody has tried the Game of Thrones whiskies, what they think of them. Well, now you actually get a chance to taste them for yourself. So I have selected five that I think you would be interested in and uh, hopefully you'll like them as well as we taste through them. Ewan, can you give us a bit of background about what this series is and how it came about? Yeah, sure. So um, obviously at, at the Azure, we have um, a huge range of different single malts in our portfolio. We have 28 individual distilleries. Um, and, you know, one of the great things about that massive selection of whiskies available to us is that we are able to offer quite a diverse range of taste, textures and flavours when it comes to single malts. Now, Game of Thrones obviously was hugely popular around the world, and it just seemed like a brilliant partnership to go into partnership with HBO and kind of bring people into the world of whiskey. Um, mm. And what we actually found when we sat down and looked at it, all of the different houses that formed the sort of Game of Thrones kingdoms, all of their own individual style, their own individual story, and obviously our single malts all have their own individual story as well. And we actually quite quickly identified which single malts kind of matched or paired nicely with the story of that house. And it might be based on the location and the geography of the site of the distillery. It might be something from the distillery's history. But it was really interesting because there was something that tied specific one of our distilleries to each one of those houses. So as soon as we started looking at it, it just all kind of came together really, really quickly and really beautifully. And yeah, and I think it's a great partnership because for me, what's most exciting about it is it's not just launching another Scotch whiskey to talk to people who already love Scotch whiskey about. It's about bringing out a range of whiskies, which maybe someone who's never considered trying Scotch whiskey before, it might actually make them just go and try some or buy a bottle and maybe then discover a love of Scotch. So it's not just great for us and sharing our single malts with the world, but I think it's actually great for the entire Scotch industry because it brings new people in and that's really what, what what we do should be all about. Certainly it's a big part of my job. Absolutely and that's everything that our whiskey stands for as well, yeah. bringing new people into the category and um, showing how wonderful and delicious and diverse whiskey can be all the different flavors that there are in there and i personally i love um the fact that you guys have had the initiative to partner with game of thrones on this and to put these whiskies together because um obviously there'll be a lot of fans of the show who are following along here can i get like a yes from people who are a big fan of the game of thrones show because i mean i certainly am i've seen every single series i binged watched the last one when i finally got my hands on it loved it completely <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Oh, a couple, few yeses coming in. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Game, so game, game of Thrones for me was probably one of the highlights of the last few years. And now that it's finished, it's just 
yeah, what, what do you do with your time? What kind of massive sci-fi drama is there to, to fill your time with? You want again, Becky, that's what you do. Yes, well, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, you know, and I think it's probably time we kick off with our first yeah. whiskies. Now, um, you know, it's it's funny because we, we talked about um, there being uh, whiskey makers coming on and, and obviously you're, you're Brandon Bass, you don't make the whiskey yourself. No, I have, um, but, not for a very long time. <laughs> I filled a, I filled a, um, a, a lorry once with barley. So nice. I contributed once. Yeah. Yeah. All fine. counts. <laughs> <laughs> it all counts. I think it was at Kalila, actually. Oh, well, no, up at Port Ellen Malting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, digressing. Um, guys, uh, first of all, before we get into our tasting, make sure you have some glasses with you. So if you have a whiskey glass, that's great. So um, the one I always like to taste whiskey out of is, um, oh, sorry, Ewan, is uh, one that looks like this. So this is a Glencairn glass. That's great for nosing and tasting. If you don't have a Glencairn glass, then a tumbler will be fine. So something that's like that is okay. If you don't have that either, then a wine glass will do um so just make sure you're not drinking out of a big pint glass or even a highball because um, you're not going to get the full effect of all of the aromas coming out but i want to introduce somebody who actually knows all about aromas and nosing and tasting because she does this for a living day in day out and she's bloody awesome so please can we welcome and give a huge round of applause for emma walker hi emma hello how are you doing? I'm going scarlet now after that introduction. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> You've not been out in the Scottish sun all afternoon. <laughs> I, I have. <laughs> yeah, I was out for a wee walk at lunchtime and it is roasting out there. Absolutely baking um, up in Edinburgh. <laughs> I <laughs> think... <laughs> So, um, so Emma is um, one of the part of the blending team at Diageo. So uh, Diageo, which um, has put out this Game of Thrones series and is the largest Scotch producer in the world. So uh, Emma is part of the team of blenders who works on creating all of the lovely whiskies that, that Diageo puts together. Uh, Emma, can you tell us a bit about your job? Like, what, is, what do you do? Yeah, so as, as Becky said, I'm one of the 12 whisky masters that we have at Diageo. Um, we're responsible for the quality of all of Diageo's Scotch portfolio. So whenever Jim Beveridge is talking about whisky and what we do every day is we are always nosing whisky. Uh, we always have a grow glass in front of us no matter what we're doing, whether we're looking after one of our existing brands and making sure it's the right quality, the right consistency, the right flavours. It, say in Johnny Walker Black Label, or whether we're looking at innovation and looking at how to create a new whiskey. We might have a row of different cast samples in front of us and we're looking to nose and assess those and see which is the best ones to use. We're also looking at how do we lay down the right whiskies to use in the future. So I started with the company in 2008 and it's really cool that 12 year old whiskies are now using whiskey that was created when I first joined. So it's really good for us to know what's going to be coming up. We need to be able to try and see into the future. So we work very closely with our colleagues in the, the Scotch Whiskey Infantry Manager, but also our colleagues across distillation and maturation to make sure we're always going to have the right flavour at every point in time. Yeah, absolutely. There's, it's great to see so many different people, a variety of people working across blending and creating all these whiskies and, and creating that consistency that you obviously need in the bottle um, yeah. to make sure that, that product is the same every time you go back to purchase it. Yeah, and no, we we do have a we do have a wide team, and part of that is so that we have a range of different people nosing the same whiskies, so you're getting a wide range of responses back. Again, Jim and other people, the teams, like folk like Maureen, who's been nosing whiskey for more than forty three years, mm -hmm. they'll get asked if their noses mm -hmm. are insured. They must be insured for millions, and the answer always is the insurance is having that team of people that can nose the whiskies together. So it means that we all balance each other out, and we can also talk about the flavours that we're perceiving that we're picking up. Because that's the great thing about flavour is uh, it's, it's like talking about colours. What you see, what you what you know is, is your own perception, what you think about, what it links back to in your own history, your own memories. But being able to then have the conversations with each other in the team and understand how other people perceive and taste things, that really helps us in how we bring a whisky together. But also helps us in how we can talk to other people about whisky and really get them to, to love it as much as we do. Yeah. Yeah. Um... 
I think, you know, I think it's wonderful what you guys are doing to sort of bring that passion for, for what you're doing yourself, like your day, your day to day job and to put it into every product that you're you're making. And then also to speak to everybody who's watching along as well and to impart that passion. And, and certainly I've benefited from speaking to you on numerous occasions about what you do. And uh, I'm sure everybody today is going to as well, um, which leads me to ask you, Emma. Um, yep. I think if anybody is going to uh, talk everybody through how uh, what's the best way to nose and taste a whiskey, it's got to be someone who does this on a daily basis. <laughs> so would you, would, would you would you mind? I think let's um, let's introduce what the first whiskey is, and then uh, then Emma, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you to to sort of run through how to do that. So um, the very first whiskey, guys. So um, the uh, whiskey bottle you have in front of you um, that's labelled number one. That's the one we're going to be starting with, and that is. Oh, let me get my picture. Yeah, ready. Go. Ready. The Singleton of Glen Dullen. Ooh, which house is this? Uh, house Tully. It's house Tully, yes. House Tully, grand. You and um, you and do you want to tell us what what is this whiskey then? So this is the Glen Singleton yeah. of Glen Dullen select. So Glen Dullen Distillery. Um, the Singleton brand is actually made up of three different single malt distilleries. There's Glen Dullen, there's Dufftown, and there's Glen Ord and all of them sit under the Singleton umbrella, um, all because of their sort of very approachable, easy to enjoy style. Now, Singleton of Glen Dullen specifically, that distillery is located in the, the sort of whiskey capital of Speyside, which is Dufftown. Um, the distillery has been around since the late 1800s, 1897. Um, it was actually built by a whiskey broker called William Williams. His father can't have liked him very much. Um, and <laughs> um, we actually rebuilt, well, built a second distillery on that site in 1972. And that's the current distillery that produces this. It makes quite a, a light, fresh, gentle style of whiskey. It's got a long fermentation, nice, slow, gentle distillation. Um, and it actually just makes for a really approachable, smooth, quite straightforward style of whiskey. Um, this one in particular is, um, I think, a really good example of of Glen Dullen. But I think it's probably best if Emma introduces people on how best to approach it, and then I can maybe talk a little bit about the the flavour notes of this particular whiskey. Sure, yep. Emma, take it away. No problem. Whenever I'm drinking, um, nosing and tasting whiskey, I'd always recommend having a glass of water next to you as well. So we'll take a sip of water first. <clears throat> That just helps to clear the palate of any other flavours you've got lingering in there, but also helps to hydrate and cool the palate as well. So you have your glass, you just swirl it a little bit and take a nose. I would recommend taking quite a gentle nose to start with. Don't try and inhale everything in all in the headspace in the glass because you don't want to burn the inside of your nose and that will make it more difficult to pick up any delicate notes later on. So you have a, a slight, quick nose, keep your mouth open as you're inhaling because then you can draw the flavour through through the nose and onto the tongue so it helps you to appreciate the different flavours there and just enjoy it. Think about the, the flavours that it reminds you of, things that you've eaten, drank, memories and enjoy the whiskey. I'll pass you back off to you. Thank you Emma. Um, yeah as I said for me this is a it's just a brilliant example of um, of that Gwendolyn style. Mm -hmm. um, I like that Emma said that you know when you're smelling something it can spark memories and I, I do the same when I'm doing tastings with people I always say to them don't give me a list of flavors don't just have list off a bunch of things that you think you can smell talk to, talk about what it reminds you of where it transports you to because smelling and tasting whiskey it can be quite a can be quite a powerful reaction when you when you first smell it because it can really sort of move you to a moment in time and you don't just think about what you smelled at that moment you think about who you're with the sounds around you, what was happening, the people that were there. So it's it's a all encompassing experience sometimes. Um, when I smell this, first note I get is that sort of vanilla cheesecake kind of um, dessert note. But then mm -hmm. there's there's a bit of spice in there as well. Actually, there's almost of like orange and cloves. And that takes me to the that sort of um, almost that's sort of Christmas time. You know, those sort of um, Christmas time sort of spices. So a lovely bit of sort of red berry in there as well, and that's again quite common with um, several of the um, the singleton expressions. That's a fruity note. When you taste it, as Emma said, you know you want to move it around your mouth a little bit. Um, 
let it coat the palate. And again, a lot of what you smell will also come across on the palate as well. Your, your sense of smell really quite powerfully dictates what you're going to taste. So when you taste it, you know, move it around, savor it. So cheers, everybody. Have a little taste of your whiskey now. Should pour mine actually and get into it. I love that <laughs> idea of um, uh, aroma and, and taste uh, invoking uh, a memory, and it's, it's so true. And they say um, our sense of smell is so is more linked to memory than any other sense that we have. So I want to hear from you guys when you're when you're nosing and tasting some of these whiskies. Do, do, does it invoke any memories for you at all? Um, what, what what comes to mind? Make you leave a comment for us. We we can see as well. I think that's something to emphasize. You know, there's no right or wrong answers because it is linked mm -hmm. to your own personal memories. So if it invokes a memory in you and someone disagrees with that, that, that's up to them. But it's always personal and there's therefore no wrong answers because it's reminding you of something from your life. And that to me is kind of beautiful, actually, because it means that no two people tasting the same whiskey will ever have exactly the same experience. I love this in from uh, Samantha, toasted marshmallow from childhood. Oh, um, oh and th this one, this one That's is a lovely. beautiful descriptor. Hmm. Uh, John Kendall says, uh, toffee apple and fairgrounds. I definitely get the apple there as well. Yep. There's yep. a lovely green apple well, note coming through. Glen Dullen is, um, I remember before I went to Glen Dullen for the first time, Keith Law, who used to be part of the team, he's retired now. Um, he was talking about it. He'd been to all of the different distilleries. Uh, he said, when you're in the still house, if you get there at the right time, all you'll smell is like freshly cut Granny Smiths. It mm. just, it works its way right through the still house. And I was like, he must be exaggerating. He's over the top. It'll be a wee bit. And you walk through and that just hit me. And I was just like, oh, he's always right. <laughs> and it does, it's so much sort of green apples. But I love with this, with this whiskey that you still have that green apples. But because of the maturation, the way that Stuart put that blend together, it just you have that apples, but you're taking it further, so you've you've got more of that sort of slightly richer fruit coming through as well, which is just beautiful. It's a lovely balanced whiskey. Mm. Yeah. This is this is um, I, I always love that kind of um, light, fresh fruit kind of style of whiskey. Um, it's mm. very um, typical of of Speyside in particular, but um, I just I love this style because it it tends to you can have it on its own, you can have it with ice, and particularly a day like today when it's like over twenty degrees, and you just want something a little bit chiller. I love yeah. it. Just um, you, you can mix it as well, which, um, which I, I've got a question for you. And actually, um, because a lot of people now are drinking whiskies and highballs. And so that's mixing whiskey with soda and ice or uh, mixing it with another mixer as well. So one of my favorite yeah. ways to drink whiskey is with uh, ginger ale. But uh, so what would you pair with this? If you were going to make a highball with uh, the Glinda and the Select, what would you what would you pair with that? Um I, I love a highball too. It actually tends to be ginger ale I go for as well. But this one I think would actually go well with um, maybe something a bit zestier, a bit fresher, maybe a sort of what we call in the UK lemonade, which is not freshly squeezed lemons. It's almost more like a, a sort of Sprite kind of um, sparkling drink. I think mm. it would keep that freshness and that lightness really, really well, actually. Um, mm. I'm just sorry, I'm distracted by Whiskey Girl 6's um, tasting notes there. They're really good, actually. <laughs> yeah, they're brought. I'm, I'm going to copy these later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, we've actually we've had that all the way through the festival. Um, the last four tastings that we've had, the last three that we've had, and today, there's just been amazing tasting notes coming from people watching. I'm like blown away by it, actually. And someone who gets paid to review yeah. whiskey, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take my job. <laughs> there's a really spot yep. on. <laughs> Yeah, I love that one day old fruit salad. It's, it's bang on. Mm -hmm. There you go. Just in case anyone missed that one day old fruit salad. Yeah, it's got that freshness, um, but there's a sort of ripeness there as well. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Mm. Uh, one of the highball serves that I tried at the weekend when it was World Whiskey Day was um, I tried using rose lemonade, uh, mm -hmm. partly because my, my kitchen wasn't well stocked at the time, so I was looking for whatever was in was in the cupboard at the time, and it worked so well because it, it just had that light floral notes that just it worked really well with the. I tried it with a couple of whiskies and it was brilliant. So I would yeah. I would highly recommend that for a, a highball serve as well. Yeah, I'll tell yeah. you what would go with, very well with this. Um, Bundaberg, who do are very well known for their ginger beer, they do a really yeah. nice um, sparkling peach juice. That would Ooh, go beautifully yeah. with it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would work. Now you said <laughs> that, like um, uh, a peach flavored Lipton iced tea. You know the yeah. the ones in the plastic bottles. Yeah, that, yeah. Was, this that was the other, 
Yeah, that was the other thing that we tried in Highball Serves at the weekend. Really, well. <laughs> really good. Yeah, spot on. <laughs> spot on. <laughs> oh, good. Look, I do see. I knew I'd have some competition. Tabitha is going to take my job. Excellent. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, actually, actually, Tabitha, I can't remember which week it was, but you were banging out the amazing tasting notes. It was with um, Bill Lumsden and uh, Brendan McCarran. We had on from Glenmorangie and Ardbeck, and oh, you were bashing them out of the park. Those guys were like, "Who is that? She's great." <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> yeah, well done, well done. Um, Glenn Dullen, um, I'm assuming everybody's enjoying this. House Tully, I've got, do you know what? I've got no memory oh, of which sure. house that was. Um, they were the um, Lords of the Riverlands, based at River Run. So that's one of the reasons why we actually thought this distillery worked really nicely with that that house because of the location. So this distillery is right in the banks of the River Fiddich. It's kind of in a little valley as you drive out of Dufton. Um, it's almost kind of tucked away. And yeah, we just saw it's kind of surrounded by this sort of lush greenery. Um, yeah. It just fits beautifully with that, with that house, I would say. Yeah, you really get that kind of um, imagery of like a lush green orchard when you're like yeah. nosing and tasting this. It's quite nice to sort of like takes you away a little bit, doesn't it? Oh dear, come on, I'm, I'm being rinsed already. Oh, Thanks. seats is coming out. <laughs> <laughs> should, have, should have done my homework. I should have watched all um, every season before um, coming onto this. I'm sorry. <laughs> should have rewatched everything. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Starting so, back in January, you know. <laughs> I know, if only I knew that we would be in this situation. Yeah. <laughs> Um, right, so Guns Allen, I think everyone's really enjoyed that. That's a really nice one to start off mm. with, really nice and fresh. It's got a palette going, really enjoyed yeah. it. Um, there's been a lot of people wondering what the other whiskies are going to be as we're moving through. So I think mm. it's probably time to move on to the second whiskey, number two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, number two, which I'm is bigger than Whiskey number two is, love that pop, <laughs> Klein Leash. This is Klein Leash Reserve, um, which represents House Tyrell. Mm -hmm. There you are. And you in? Yeah. So this um, this was one of one of my sort of two, I would say, favourites from the entire range. So I was delighted that you included it. Um, <laughs> you, you actually included, I think, all of my sort of favourite ones from that selection, actually. So nice, Ooh. nice done. Um, You're welcome. So Klein Leash Reserve. Um, you'll see on screen this is a little bit higher in alcohol, so do not be afraid to add a splash of water to this. Um, you will find that this um, does open up really nicely with a little splash of water. Do give it a smell and taste first without, um, because there's some lovely aromas there that you can still detect without adding water, but definitely. A little dash of water on top of this will just open up and reveal a bit more. Now, Klein Leash Distillery is a lovely, lovely distillery, actually. It's located up in the northern highlands of Scotland, um, in the village of Brora. Um, so I'm, I'm in Inverness right now, which is the capital of the highlands. Brora is about one hour's drive north of here. If you drive for about another hour beyond that, you hit the town of Wick, where I'm from originally. If you keep going, you drop off the most northerly point of the UK. So this is right up there. This is um, a very, one of the most northerly distilleries on mainland Scotland. Um, it's renowned and has been for many, many years for producing what we refer to as a sort of Highland Maritime style. And it also has a lovely sort of waxy creaminess in terms of texture and aroma. Um, it's been around for just over 200 years. It actually celebrated its 200th anniversary last year in 2019. And it's, um, it's a distillery which is adored by a growing number of single malt fans, but also it's really loved by blenders. And I'm sure Emma can talk to this, but the flavour and texture they have in Klein Leash is phenomenal for blending with because it adds an element that nothing else can add to a blended scotch. So it's, it's kind of adored by both sides of that ever yep. everlasting debate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think Klein Leash is it's just amazing. Cause for me, the first thing that I always get is it's just citrus. It's almost like freshly cut citrus. Sometimes yeah. it'll be more lemons, sometimes it's more limes. It just depends on almost the warmth of it as to what you're getting out there first. But it's then almost like a sort of like quite like sort of floral, almost like heather notes or um 
not gore, not so much gorse, but it's that sort of, you know, almost like a warm field. It just has that mm. lovely smell. And then you're getting onto almost like a sort of wax, you know, it's you know uh, where you think of like uh, wax lemons. It's, so it's tying in with that and you start to get this waxy aroma. Then when you take a sip of it, you just get this lovely mouth, it's like mouth coating, it's engulfing. It just has this lovely uh, smooth effect on the palate. And it just has that lovely waxiness that Klein Leash is renowned for. But it makes with that citrus note, it just it just breaks it up beautifully and it brings a lovely, lovely balance to it. And it has that, they like say that maritime style. So it's almost like a slight salinity to it that just stops it from becoming too sweet or too almost too cloying. It just keeps it's perfectly balanced. It is it's such a lovely distillery. Yeah. Yeah. Um I'm I'm a huge fan of this one in particular. Um Yeah. Mm. For for me, I, I get that sort of little citrus bit right to the start. And then I, I find it dives into a lot of, sort of tropical fruit notes. Um, yeah, it's like it's developed further. That, that, yeah, that, yeah. yeah, that fruitiness is matured into tropical. It's beautiful. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a really nice dram. Um, in terms of texture, it's got that cloying kind of um, sort of creamy, almost honey sort of mm. feeling. And yeah, I, I really like this one in particular. Um, quite a high strength. So if you haven't, add a little splash of water to it because it does open up it reveals itself quite quite substantially i think yeah it's, it's definitely a favorite in our house so the whiskeys mm. that we're doing today we accidentally have all those and i've opened all of them and nice. the kind leashes the kind leash is the one that it is is nearly finished uh, it's definitely been a highlight over the past few weeks it's, it's just beautiful it just keeps on yeah. it keeps on growing then even with the highest happy. strength oh yeah it's oh. just that vibrancy um but it's not too in your face. It's it's fresh, but it's quite gen I, yeah. But it's just got everything in there. Yeah, yeah. it's now almost giving us a, a kind of barber jacket kind of waxiness. It's yeah, it's lovely, lovely drama. Yeah. So it just yeah. it just keeps revealing little little nuggets of flavors. It's, it's lovely. The kind um, of you know that lovely dried pineapple kind of note comes through as well. You know the kind that you might mm -hmm. get in like a tropical muesli kind of pack and um, yeah. like um, fruit leather that like yeah. all that kind of thing that you get a roll of fruit like that. And with the water, it just like it really, it really makes itself known. I love, yeah, I love that waxiness um, about Klein Leash. Um, for yeah. me, like one of my favorite uh, cocktails in the entire world is a Bobby Burns. So it's mm -hmm. a Scotch whiskey based cocktail made with uh, vermouth and a few dashes of Benedictine. But Klein Leash works so well in that cocktail with the waxiness. It really stands up to the vermouth and the whole thing just comes together with the fruitiness yeah. and a little bit of herbal. It's just beautiful, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really, really um, nice, and I think this 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 whiskey in particular, um, with it being slightly higher strength, would really stand up in that kind of cocktail too. Yeah, yeah. Emma mentioned that sort of Granny Smith aroma at Glendolen mm. in the still house. I think at Klein Leash, there's a a certain point during the distillation when you get sort of freshly cut pineapple notes, isn't there, Emma? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I think it's probably probably about at the start, quite early on. Mm. You almost get citrus first and then it goes to that pineapple and it's all you start to get a slightly longer chain esters coming through and it just has that love it lingers it all, you almost feel like it's wrapping around you as you're walking through the still house it's just just lovely um yeah. and then it starts to get you almost start to get that creaminess that waxiness coming through as you get further through the distillation process as well it's yeah it's, it's a lovely distillery uh a few of my friends have started off their work there uh, so Becky, who's in our regulatory team, she started off there as a as a guide, and that's mm. still always her go to. Um, she's always very excited whenever there's a new new client leash that's launched. <laughs> she's very proud and very protective, and um, I think rightly so. That's it's always amazing whiskey. Mm. So what's so what's the story behind? Um, so this one was at House Tyrell, you know, and what was the story behind? Yeah. Tyrell? So again, um, a lot of it's down to that sort of location. Um, if you travel up to where client leash is located, it's it's about maybe about half a mile, three quarters of a mile away from the, the actual sea. And it's surrounded by sort of rolling hills, really lush, fertile farmland. Um, and yeah, you, you can see it there. Um, <laughs> and you know, when you look at House Tyrell, they're located at High Garden. Again, really lush, fertile, beautiful location. Um, so we just thought it kind of tied quite nicely to House Tyrell. The other thing that you know, when you look at House Tyrell from the from the series, there was this sort of ongoing feeling that they should never be underestimated. You know, they always had that very gentle, very mellow feel, but then could be quite sort of um, clever when, when necessary. 
And I think <laughs> with Langley Shen, you know, that there's that aspect of it as well. You know, it's a it's at first glance, it's a very smooth, very gentle, approachable drum. But actually, once you dive into it and really try lots of expressions from that distillery, there's a lot of depth and a lot going on there. Mm. And and like Emma, how how exactly do you create that waxy kind of style? Because there aren't that many whiskies that have that quality to them. So what is it that Klein Leash does differently, or that you do at Klein Leash yeah. that then creates that kind of waxy, oily kind of mouthfeel? So part of it with Klein Leash is it's similar to Glendolin. You've got a really a lovely long fermentation, so you start to create those uh, fruity notes. You get lots of lovely fruity esters formed. You're also getting what we call uh, organic acids developed in there as well. And then once you go through the distillation process, um, in the in the tanks that we collect the spirit coming through, you start to, to build up a, a level of long chain fatty acids. So this is where you've got flavors that have developed in the fermentation, we distill them, and they just become longer and more complex. And part of it is the effect of these long chain fatty acids. They build up and you start to get that lovely creaminess, that waxy flavours coming through. And it matches really well with that lovely fruitiness. Uh, we know that it's definitely linked to those uh, long chain fatty acids in, in, the, um, in the collection vat because one, once that got cleaned out accidentally at silent season, um and it took us a long long time to get that lovely waxiness back so there's definitely a, a slight change in ways of working at Klein Leash to make sure that we d we don't lose that lovely waxiness and that intensity of waxiness again because it's it's so beloved of both the people that love the single malts but it's so ex important to us when we're making our blended scotch whiskies as well yeah i can imagine within that all the whiskies that you're working with that's a very particular style of whiskey that um must be so important for for sort of building on so when like when when you're creating um a, so a, a single malt is obviously made from whiskey that's made in one single distillery but that one distillery is still a blend of different casks or different types of whiskies made there but when you're creating a blended scotch which is obviously mm -hmm. from lots of different distilleries how do what's the process of going through that how do you decide which whiskies go into a blend and or even sticking to a recipe when as you just said at Klein Leash if something changes slightly like every whiskey is different like every cask is different so how do yeah. you ensure that they always taste the same like going forward I mean as as you said we're very lucky um in Diageo we've got 28 individual malt distilleries we've also got Cameron Bridge Distillery which makes a lovely lighter style of spirit that we we as in the blending team absolutely love um across that range of distilleries we've got such a wide range of flavors I mean as I said you've got Cameron Bridge with that light creamy very very delicately fruity flavor to your Klein Leashes your Glen Dullins your Cardoos where you've got a lovely vibrant fresh fruit a lighter style flavors there um within space side again you still have you've got some of those heavier meatier more complex flavors that we can get from distilleries such as mortlach benrinus which are hugely important and then we go over to the west coast where we've got our peated whiskies like at talisker at lagvillen and at kalila which are hugely important now we make whiskey in this pretty much the same way at all of our 28 distilleries but there's just slight changes and those changes have been decided upon over the decades by the people that have worked at the distilleries um how they've set up the distillery how they run them day to day so what can be what can seem like a very minor minor choice can have a huge impact for example in the candle uh when you're emptying out the mash tun so you grind up your your malt your malted barley that goes into your mash tun with hot water that extracts the sugars out you get a very thin uh a very thin sugary liquid called wort if you drain that liquid out very quickly, you get a cloudy, you get a cloudy liquid coming out, and that's bringing some of those sort of the cereals, some of the solids that you get from that mash tun, and that's what happens in the candle. And in the final spirit, you get quite a nutty, spicy cereal note, and that's partly because of how you run the mash tun. Whereas at Glendullen, um, you run that very slowly, so you get a very clean, uh, clear liquid coming through, and that helps to, to emphasise the fruitiness that we want. Fermentation has a huge impact. If you have a shorter fermentation, you get um, you get more nutty cereal flavors coming through. If you have a long, slow fermentation, you get some of those cereal flavors, but then you also get a lovely fruity flavor coming through as you have time to build up some of these lovely esters that give you that vibrancy and that you get at the top of the nose when you're nosing your whiskies. Um, with some of our, uh, you emphasize that fruity flavor as well in how you run the stills. 
So if you run uh, the distillations uh, quite slowly, you get a lot of copper contact. So you're taking out any heavy notes that you might have developed in fermentation. And you get, you're emphasizing, you're making more of those lovely, light, fruity flavors. If you have a quicker distillation, you've got less cup contact. And if you're using condensers such as your worm tubs, you have um, a quicker, you've got a quicker distillation, sorry, got less cup contact, and you have more complexity, you've got more heavy notes in there. So you might have more of those lovely, meaty, meaty complex flavors that we can see in Mortlach and Bermarinus that really give more depth and flavors to some of our, some of our whiskies. There's so, there's so much that goes into creating a whiskey. I think a lot of people, when they order a dram at a bar or they order a bottle and a, in, they go and buy one in the supermarket or in a, in a specialist retailer, there's just so much to it that goes into that particular bottle from like creating all of those flavours in the distilleries down to yourself and the blending team selecting those whiskies and what works best with each other not to yes, mention yeah. the variations that happen through maturation over like decades as well it's there Ex are so exactly many yeah and you get the different you get different flavor styles for maturation so if it's in ex bourbon casks american oak you get a lovely sweet vanilla flavors if we're using european oaks that have been used in the sherry industry of that have been seasoned with with wine you get more uh, richer raisin notes coming through and more tannic flavors so it has an effect on mouthfeel as well so when we're actually, when we're putting a blend together, whether that's a blended Scotch whiskey or a single malt, where we're blending together different casks, we're looking to get a balance of those flavours of distillery character, but then getting a balance of maturation style as well. And it's all to create the same whiskey each time. So when we're doing a blended Scotch whiskey, you might have different, each time you might have different, very different volumes of individual distilleries going in there, but you're balancing that with a different mix of wood types, but always creating the same whiskey at the end of it. So it's, it's great. It's, it keeps us in a job. So it's, it's very important. <laughs> <laughs> and it did, just very briefly, there was a question that came in from Sam Simmons, who is fascinated by everything you're saying, um, uh, also a whiskey maker himself. So uh, but he's asking, what's an example of a long, slow fermentation that you guys have? I mean, all, um, all very good one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What was that you? Uh, time in the book. Yeah, Oban is probably a good okay. example. I think that's... Um, up to 106, 110 hours. Um, and that then allows a lot of those sort of citrus notes to start to develop. So a lot of people, when they smell and taste open, they get that almost sort of, you know, if you've got an orange peel and you squeeze it and you get the orange oils, it's almost that sort of orange oil sort of aroma that comes through. And again, that's harking back to the fermentation being very, very long with open. Yeah, and that there is an open in the Game of Thrones series. Will we there be is. tasting it, won't we? No. <laughs> um, who is ready for a, another whiskey? I hope no one's run, rushing ahead and pouring before we've gotten to them, by the way, because I know that some of you are eager beavers. Um, I think it's probably time we move on to whiskey number three. Before we do, Emma, uh, I know you have to rush off. So do you have time to sit with us with this one? Yep, I'll, I'll wait for this one, then I'll, then I'll make a run for it. Fab. Fab. So this is whiskey number three, guys. So you're bottled marked with a number three. I don't know if you can see that. My light's quite strong. Hurry up. Um, so this one is um, probably one of my favourite distilleries. It's so in it's got such an interesting character, um, extremely unique. And I know we're going to have a lot of people super excited once I say the name of this whiskey because they've all been like saying, "Is this going to be tasted today? I haven't tried it yet. I really want to." It is. Mortlach Six Kingdoms. Here it is. Mortlach 15, 15 year old? Yes. 15 Here we years go. Old. Mortlach 15 year old. Um, <clears throat> Ewan, talk us through this one. The Beast of Dufton. Yes, the Beast of Dufton. So the first whiskey we tried was from Glendullen Distillery in, in Dufton. Um, this one is also from that same small, small town in the middle of Speyside. Um, this one was actually, uh, I think, the first distillery built in Dufton established back in 1823 and it was actually built on an ancient battleground so i think it ties into game of thrones very well just for that reason alone um <laughs> the distillation process at mortlach has been described as fiendishly complex which i think is being kind um normally in <laughs> scotland we do a uh, double distillation so the spirits distilled twice um once in a wash still once in a spirit still at Mortlach, we do what we refer to as a 2.81 distilled. Now, essentially, there, there's six stills in Mortlach Distillery, three wash stills, three spirit stills. 
Uh, each one is a different size and shape, um, which is unusual. And at Mortlich, we do essentially a double distillation. At the same time, we're also doing kind of a partial triple distillation and also kind of a partial quadruple distillation. And then all three streams are brought together and that forms the spirit of Mortlich. That's it simplified in probably the easiest way I can possibly do. <laughs> That's probably well, the easiest explanation of that process yeah. I've ever had. <laughs> well, yeah. well done, you. I'm, I'm going to get that, that memorized because I struggled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can go into a lot of detail on this, but it could take about an hour to actually explain <laughs> that distillation process. It's um, so complicated. But essentially what it results in is a spirit, pre-maturation, a spirit that is... Um, quite rich, quite meaty, quite bold, um, mm -hmm. very, very heavy in style, quite powerful. Um, and then over the years as it's matured, that power, it remains, but it becomes tempered slightly. So it kind of rounds it off a little bit. Um, it's more like it's been, it's been kind of a cult whiskey for a long time. Um, it's been this of the thinking person's rich, heavy space -side. Um This one in particular, First fill sherry seasoned casks and then finished in American oak bourbon casks. So casks that previously held bourbon. And what that's given you is a whiskey which I think this is actually a phenomenal expression of Mortlach. It's very, very rich. It's um, got all those key Mortlach aromas and flavours, those sort of dried fruits, the Christmas cake, the someone there said melted dark chocolate. Absolutely. All those rich, heavy flavours. But there is a little hint of some vanilla sweetness in there as well. So it just kind of balances it really, really beautifully. Um, what, what do you guys think of it? Have you, have you smelled it yet? Um, I, th I think it's lovely. This, again, is one that we're starting to run out of in the house. Yeah. <laughs> this, was, uh, um, this was a later addition to the range because this one yeah. talked about the six kingdoms because or originally there were seven kingdoms in Westeros and then reduced down at the end of the se season, I should say, or series um, to six kingdoms. So this was one that we brought out after the others had already been released. Um, but I think it was worth the wait. I think this is absolutely phenomenal. I, I love that. Um, I love the balance. So it's quite, it is very unusual to have a whiskey that's been matured is sherry style casks and then go into American oak. Uh, and I think that works so well. Stuart did a great, a great yeah. job with this one. It, like you say, it just tempers it beautifully. You still have that lovely complexity, but you have a lovely sweetness that just works really, really well. And I think, yeah, it ties to that. The the change in the change in the houses ties into just that change in way of thinking about how to work with Motlac. Mm. But yeah, it's yeah. it's beautiful, beautiful whiskey. Mm. Yeah. So for people who have just joined, we are currently on tasting number three. So this is the Mortlac 15 year old. Um the Beast of Dufton um, with a really complicated distillation process uh, <laughs> that Ewan has very quickly run through, which is extremely, <laughs> I, I can't, that, I'm, I swear the amount of times people have tried to explain that to me and it still won't stay in my head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> that we, we, we have diagrams explaining it and every diagram that seems to be slightly different as well. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's diabolical, but it makes amazing mm. spirit. Mm. Yeah, but it, for me, Mortlac is like it's really meaty. It's slightly salty as well. I find mm -hmm. um, it's got this like lovely again like dried fruit kind of character, yeah. and it is um, it, it feels like really powerful. Particularly like in some some of the Mortlacs I've tried, which are slightly older, are super powerful and a really nice meaty kind of character. But this this is a really lovely expression. Why? Um, so what what's the the how do you match the the flavor profiles of the whiskies that you're going for against like the i suppose the theme of of the houses so obviously this is the six kingdoms but like when yeah. every distillery is different so for instance the klein leash is bottled at 51 percent. so mm -hmm. why go for a higher abv on that why like what's the what's the decision behind creating that flavor profile for that whiskey as opposed to just sure. going with any other klein leash so a lot of that was down to 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 sort of individual blenders' discretion, what strength they felt that whiskey was yeah. at its absolute peak. Um, an exception would be the Talisker, which um, we bottled that, I think, if memory serves me correctly, at the same strength as we tend to bottle most of our Talisker expressions at. Yeah, but yeah the that's others, right. I think we're all at the blenders' discretion. So I'm sure Emma can talk to 
that a little bit more than I could. Yeah, that's exactly it. And as you say, that's part of the fun of working in, in the, the bigger team is Stuart created these and he created them essentially at, at Castrant. And we would just work through in different tastings and just look to see uh, different uh, different dilutions and just look and see where you got that best balance of flavours, where you really got the, the highlights. I think with Mortlach, we're looking at sort of there is that fruitiness, where you really emphasise that fruitiness, but still got the, the spice and the vanilla flavours coming through. So it's all about getting the right balance of flavour. What's the best, the best um, dilution for that? But then also where you get the right mouthfeel and, and understanding that. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree. This is a um, Mort Lack's always been one of my favourite whiskies. Um, yeah. uh, there was there was a new range of whiskies that was uh, released from the distillery. Not, I say not that long ago, but actually it's feeling like quite a while ago now in my memory. Mm. Um, but which was revamped again recently. So it's almost like um, I, I, it's so nice to see different expressions from this distillery coming to the fore because previously it was more of a um, the DHA flora and fauna range was was kind of it really. So it's nice to see yeah. more expressions of more lack available. Um, so yeah, it was, one, had... it was one you really had to seek out, and it was one that mm. only sort of more of the sort of cult whiskey geeks kind of knew about. Mm. Um, and that's not meant as a disparaging comment. It was one yeah. that people who'd really spent time learning about whiskey that they sort of discovered and then kind of kept as a closely guarded secret. And it is more widely available now, but it's still a whiskey which, you know, real fans of that more bold style absolutely love. For me, it's yeah. about as big and bold you can go with a Scotch whiskey before stepping into that smoky territory. Yeah, definitely. I love this one. Subtle fish supper with salt and chip pie sauce on the nose. I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I can get that. Not like yeah. definitely had, like you were saying, that slightly savoury note to it. Yeah. yeah. It works. It works really well, um, and you can play with it in different ways. That's why Mortlach and these complex whiskies are really important to us as well. If we're creating a blended Scotch whisky, because you want that, it, it helps us to bridge where we have a wide range of distillery flavors. So where you have a lovely light, light style flavor like Glendolen, say, and you might have a stronger smoky flavor like Lagavulin and ah. Kalila, having some Mortlach or, or, or a similar type of whiskey almost helps to bridge that that sort of that wide that wide area between the two and helps bring them together but you bring out more complexity you might bring out more flavors in the motlac that we don't see if you just have the glass of motlac in front of you you can bring out different layers of flavor in there so it, it's, it's an amazing whiskey to work with that style of whiskey yeah definitely um i mean the, all the whiskies within the DJ portfolio are just completely different and i think one person who creates probably one of the most unique styles of whiskey has uh, just knocked on the door so we've got a, a a guest visitor a surprise guest um might give away what one of the whiskies is once I bring them <laughs> into the conversation. Um, but guys, if you're watching, I want you to give a big round of applause and a huge warm hello to Colin Gordon. Hi, hey. Colin. <coughs> hello, Hi, everyone. Colin. How are you doing? I'm great, thanks. How are you all? Yeah, grand, thank you. So um, Colin, you you are the distillery manager for Lagavulin. That's uh, that's right. Yep, yep. So this isn't my office. I'm uh, home uh, relaxing now. So it's a pleasure to join you all. I'm so pleased to have you with us as well. So we've got um, we've got our lovely ambassador, our blender, and our distiller. We've got like the three like big skills that are leading Diageo's whiskey team right here. People who are putting all the whiskies together and telling the stories about them. So thank you so much for joining us. Lagavulin is obviously on Isla on the South Coast, one of my favorite places in the world, uh, which we would have been at um, around this time yeah. actually um, mm -hmm. for the Isla Festival. So it's a bit of a shame. How How is everything going on Isla right now? Yeah, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's been really strange. Just we normally have what, 3,000 people by now extra and maybe a thousand extra camper vans um, <laughs> but so it's really strange it's eerily quiet in Port Ellen um, but yeah lots happening the distilleries we're all trying to do what we can um, virtually to for people that always come and make the pilgrimage over just share the share the weekend and the week with them so 
Um, I know there are some uh, really exciting uh, plans, a lot of the distilleries that get involved. So all of the distilleries across um, Isla do get involved with, um, they are going to be putting on tastings um, over the next week or so. So um, if you come across any of those, then do have a watch because I think there are some really fun ones coming up and some really fun whiskies they're going to be tasting and talking through. So that would be really cool. Um, Emma, I know you are going to have to run away from us and leave us, um, but thank you. Yep. So no, nothing personal, Colin. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we live in strange times, Emma. I won't take it personally. <laughs> I've got to go with it too, Colin. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, do you know, Colin? Oh, I've got to go wash my hair, mate. Oh, You're yeah. right. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me along. It's been it's been lovely talking to you guys and being able to talk about the whiskies. Uh, but I will catch the end of this uh, later on as well. So. Look forward to hearing from you all, especially you, Colin. Uh, but I'll speak to you guys later. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks, Emma. Yeah. Bye. 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 And there she goes. And then there were the three of us. Colin, mm -hmm. thank you for joining us and um, uh, for joining our live stream. If anybody's looked away from their screen and looked back all of a sudden, Emma hasn't just morphed in. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, you've changed. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, Colin, it's so great to have you with us, um, and especially to talk us through the next couple of whiskies that we're going to be moving into uh, now as well, because um, the flavour style of the the other two that are in the range, uh, the Game of Thrones range, are uh, I find are well, the the a peaty, a little bit salty. They've got that lovely kind of character. So anybody who's familiar with the Game of Thrones series might now have an inkling of the direction we're going with these. So um, I think what's the next one we have? Uh, up so let's move into whiskey number four um which is here we are talisker uh this is a a, a talisker uh, representing house greyjoy mm -hmm. um not one of the most popular houses in game of oh, thrones um, not so much they didn't come across so well did they no. <laughs> i think i think the whiskey was better received yes it definitely thrones. was yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Um, so uh, Talisker being uh, on the Isle of Skye, um, one of the most beautiful places in the world. Um, that's it. Not a photo taken today, sadly, but um, <laughs> it may it may well have been. It's been beautiful weather yeah. everywhere today, isn't it? It's, um, it's been wonderful. Um, you were talking to the, the Talisker and let us know. Yeah, sure. Um, so this distillery, it's the oldest distillery on the Isle of Skye. Um, which is probably one of the beautiful places. So, if you know, um, yes, yeah, so it's the oldest distillery in the Island of Sky, one of the most beautiful locations, I think, for pretty much any distillery in the world. It's absolutely stunning. Um, the drive to Sky, the journey to get there, this scene you see in front of you is really actually quite representative of how it often looks. Um, the distillery has been around since 1825, um, built by some brothers called Hugh and Kenneth McCaskill. And they had a fairly sort of turbulent history. I mean, the actual distillery burned down in 1960 and then took a couple of years to be rebuilt. But the, the style of whiskey that they make at Talisker is, is really distinct to that distillery. It's got everything that you'd expect from a distillery which is on the coast of the Atlantic, getting battered by the sea, by the ocean, every day of the year, pretty much. Um, the whiskey, traditionally from Talisker, has lots of, sort of pepper spice. When you first sip it, you'll get that peppery prickle right on the tip of the tongue. It's got a smokiness. It's what we describe as sort of medium peated, so it's um, definitely have a smokiness, but it's not a, a really powerful smoke, which is more sort of um, Collins territory. Um, but it's got a lovely maritime note as well. It's got sort of brine kind of um, coastal sweetness to it too. So there's a lot going on with this one. We bottled this a little bit higher than the usual 40%. This is bottled at 45.8% alcohol volume. And that's traditionally the strength that most of the Talisker expressions are bottled at. So we, we stuck with that for this one. We, we find that that strength, that peppery spice, is just a little bit amplified and it just carries through beautifully in the flavour. So if you don't have a glass of it in front of you, Pour one now and have a little smell. This is such a 
beautiful, beautiful whiskey. I remember the first time I tried this being blown away by it's almost like simplicity, but it's this beauty and simplicity. It's um, yeah. this, this lovely salty yeah. kind of maritime character, but this like lovely fruitiness to it as well. It's almost like um, fruit grilled on a barbecue kind of flavor while sitting next to the sea as it rolls in and mm. um, that kind of character. And, we, you know, we were talking a bit earlier about um, how whiskies remind you of uh, they, they evoke memories that you've had in the past of like bits and pieces and things you've been doing and and, and that for me is is definitely a, a, that's the, the the image that it brings to mind for me does any does anybody else like get anything from this glass as you're nosing and tasting it like what kind of images is it bringing to mind for you guys um i love this one from from gem scotland uh Talisker was her very first whiskey experience and would always have a very special place in her heart which is lovely mm. i think anyone that's been to Talisker it it, it stays imprinted on you and it's yeah. am amazing how whiskey does take you to a place becky like you're saying and i think especially i remember the first time i went to talisker and that's like sweet coastal note that maritime uh it's it's a beautiful dram lovely whiskey yeah. mm. I, for me this particular one i think it's one of the most elegant expressions of talisker i've had because it has that really balance that great balance i should say of the the brain the sweetness but then the smoke and the spice and they all just kind of sit in harmony. There's no one dominating. It's just really well put together, I think. Mm. Let us know your tasting notes of this one, guys, as it's, as it's coming through. I love that um, that oatmeal thing. You really get that in the texture as well, but a kind mm. of like grainy kind of porridge style of um, flavor, which is lovely. In fact, yeah. there's, um, Colin, you'll know uh, Emma, who uh, who runs her, her own b, &B on uh, Isla, who is yeah. a massive fan of putting uh, Lagavulin in her porridge, yeah. <laughs> which is yeah. a huge, huge thing. I think a lot of people in Scotland are doing that day to day. Yeah, she's been... Uh... She was a forerunner for the movement, and uh, we thank her for it, Emma, yeah. 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 She's yeah, been doing her bit for the island. Uh, she's actually been doing a lot for the island just now. They're putting baking in a, in a cool box at the end of the road, and it's become the best-selling uh, best <laughs> establishment on the island just now, I think. Fantastic. I think so, yeah. it's um, She's got a wonderful place. The hospitality is is wicked, so lovely. Um, Tabitha, again, Port Bury, Um absolutely one of the one of the best whiskies um for me one of the best taliskas i ever had was um neist point yes yeah absolutely, absolutely stunning fantastic. whiskey that was just delicious mm. i don't know if you can buy that anymore it was a travel retail exclusive so you could only find it in duty free i think it's still out there um it was actually another really elegant expression of talisker one that i also really loved it was mm. a little pricier but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how does this talisker um represent um the its its house? So uh, we're going so, here with um Yeah, this Grey is Greyjoy. So Greyjoy for anyone that follows uh, the Game of Thrones was um this sort of Iron Islands um and this was a sort of essentially a nation of seafarers. Um and if you've seen images of, of their sort of um their castle and where they stayed on those iron iron islands. It was pretty bleak. It was pretty rugged. Um, it was very much uh, an environment dominated and governed by the sea. And when you look at the Isle of Skye, you know, a lot of it talks to that as well. And it doesn't look particularly bleak there. Um, and it actually can be some of the most beautiful, sun-blessed places on the planet. But um, again, the environment is very much dominated by the sea, from the weather, from the, the sort of landscape to even the sort of the food i mean on talisker you get some of the best oysters that you'll ever find anywhere in the world and actually this tram a wee bit poured on top of an oyster and then sucked down is just incredible so you know i think that pairing was probably the first one that just jumped out as as the most logical of all of the houses and all of the whiskies because you know you look at the iron islands and sky just springs to mind Probably sky on a winter's day rather than a summer's day. Sky on a, a hot summer's day is stunning. But on a winter's day, yeah, they kind of talk to the Iron Islands a little bit. Definitely. A, a lot of people um, don't really, it's a, it's a question a lot of people tend to ask about um, whiskies that have that kind of salty kind of maritime character to them. Where does that saltiness come from? Is it, does it come from the sea? Like, is it in the distillation process? What's the, what's the reason for that? No one's a hundred percent sure. So a lot of the sort of um, imagery is about the sort of the casks breathing the sea air and 
taking on that saltiness. But a lot of the casks from coastal distilleries are actually matured in mainland Scotland. They're not always matured at the distillery, and yet they still have that maritime character. So there's still a little bit of a mystery about exactly at which point that maritime note gets imparted. Um, although let's not forget, Scotland is a maritime nation. I mean, you're never more than 60 or 70 miles from the sea, pretty much anywhere in Scotland. Um, so the assumption must be that it is imparted earlier in the process, maybe during fermentation, maybe during distillation when those vapours are interacting with the, the salt in the air. No one's 100% sure, but certainly with Talisker and when you look at some of the other coastal distilleries, even including Clyde Leash, there's definitely that maritime element present in them. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's interesting because I don't necessarily get as much saltiness in, say, Kalila or Lagavulin, which are both on island and coastal distilleries as well. Um, I get it more so in Talisker, which I would describe as a, a maritime malt. Yeah. But with the other distilleries, with Kalila and Lagavulin, there's more of a, a, a bonfire smoke that comes from them and this kind of like lovely fruity peatiness, particularly with uh, Kalila, the young Kalila. Yeah. Um, yeah. which really comes through that that beautiful orchard fruitiness mixing with that smoke is just so so delicious yeah. um colin i mean yeah i mean you 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 run like a in on isla and before that you were running the port ellen maltings um did, not yeah, that long ago when did, when did you take over at like a it two years ago to the day nearly mm -hmm. um we did an official handover at fish so uh, it's two years since i've been up at Lagavulin. Uh, I think was, that was quite an emotional day for, um, for Georgie, yeah, wasn't it? <laughs> Georgie, yeah, Georgie handed me over the keys. I thought I was going to have to prize them out of her hand, but we got <laughs> I remember that. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, it was, I mean, when you're at Port Ellen Maltins, you provide seven of the nine distilleries on Isla with uh, peated malt. So you build a relationship and see exactly what, what the importance is of the peat and how it transfers through. So great grounding and... Now we get to finish off the process at Lagavulin. It's uh, a great job. Seeing it all the way through, hey. Yeah. Um, guys, if you've if you've got any questions about barley or peat, then Colin is your guy to answer them. So Colin has spent how long did you say? Fifteen years. Oh no, I was only three. I was only three. Oh, three. Years okay, he spent. He only spent three years at the morning. So I mean, I maybe don't. Know. Know. <laughs> I don't like know. Fifteen years sometimes. <laughs> Colin, Colin knows so much about um, malting, so uh, bar that's that's getting the barley ready um, to then go into the distillery so that it's ready to start making whiskey. So it needs to go through a malting process first, and uh, Colin basically ran uh, the port and maltings, which supplies uh, the malted barley for the majority of distilleries on Isla. So it's a massive job. As you can imagine the amount of barley that goes through that um, location uh, every single day is a huge job. So if anybody's got any questions for Colin around barley or around peat, then please fire away, let him let him answer them for them. In fact, there's one here from Liam Scandra, um, who's asked how much research has been done into the origins or location of the peat and the difference in flavor imparted, because obviously, you know, there's there's a lot of difference in the flavor styles of some of the whiskies that have been, that, have, that use peated malt, but. yeah. Does that come from the peat? How much comes from the peat itself? It's it's, a, it's, it's it's been a hot topic. Uh, there's been a lot of research done. Um, a chap that was the manager before me, or probably ten years before me, they did a lot of work at looking at different peats and how they it sort of impart uh, their flavour or impact the taste. Um, obviously, peat is made up from different plants wherever it is in Scotland or the world. So if you're up in Orkney it's going to be a completely different makeup from Isla. So okay. Isla is very much moss, sphagnum moss, heather. Uh, there's no trees, there's there's no wood uh, in it. So that, there's a lot of tests that were done and, and blind tastings and looking at the sort of makeup of um, different peat compounds or the phenol compounds. And a lot of people felt there wasn't a huge difference but um, certainly if you spoke to the guys that worked at Port Ellen Maltins, uh, they'd always tell you the Isla Peats were by far superior. <laughs> burn, the best, <laughs> burn the best, give you the best smoke. And they certainly wouldn't have wanted to be using anything else. So, uh, yeah, I, I, it's they are different across the region. So uh, we certainly when we were at, on Isla, we, we use Isla Peat. 
Absolutely. But that's what's so inherent to like the Isle of Whiskey style, isn't it? This your identity. Like it, ha- it would be yeah. weird if you started using mainland peat to like smoke your barley. It's, well, there's make- been, there has been times in the, in, in the past, like maybe when it's been very, very wet, that they've had to mix a bit of dry stuff in. Um, so they would maybe bring a little bit across, but certainly it's all Isle of Peat. You know, it's here on the island. That's why the Maltons was brought built here in 1973 because it's right on the doorstep. So that's what we want to be using. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've got. The, we'll move on to the whiskey number five in a minute, which um, I'm guessing you've all realised what that is. If you haven't by now, then <laughs> <we're in>. um, <laughs> but just one, just one more question actually, which comes from uh, Tabitha, which I think is quite um, a hot topic at the moment um, amongst. Sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, amongst a few people in the industry. So uh, the question is, uh, how much does the variety of barley affect the taste of the finished whiskey? Do, do you want do you want me to answer that you it's uh we used to get asked about it a lot i think there's some really interesting trials going on uh, across the industry with barley variety I, I i personally having worked with different varieties um pot, pot still malt what we made at the maltlands and what distilleries use it, you're, you're looking obviously for for, for starch to, to get the yield you want um and there's very little difference i think if if you look at some of the stuff that maybe people like glenn morangy did mashing in some chocolate malt like a completely different style of malt you in part absolutely get different flavors coming through but different barley varieties i personally would say it's pretty minimal Um, obviously you get much more flavor changes from things like fermentation with different yeasts than you would with different barleys but it's an inter- interesting conversation and it's been great to see like a lot of old style crops beer barley and things um getting used again grown up in orkney and whatnot so really interesting because barley is always quite susceptible to disease so it's always good to try different varieties and grow different varieties so um, mm. but who knows maybe in 10 15 years we'll see but personally not not a huge difference or for taste my understanding as well is that a lot of distilleries, if they do change the strain of the barley that they're using, they will actually make minor adjustments to the, the entire steps of the distillation process so that the, what the spirit they get at the end is actually the same as from the previous strain of barley. So you can actually change strain of barley and get the same resulting style of spirit at the end. So potentially, yes, there could be small variances, but they can actually adjust and accommodate to, to almost negate those changes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah obviously there's a lot that you can do throughout the whole process to tweak yeah. whatever it is you're getting out of um the well, the barley and then through the fermentation as well so you can have a longer or shorter fermentation or just um a different type of spirit run as well you take your cuts separately um just the, like the production of whiskey can be very comp- it's very simple but it can be very complicated as well and i i agree i think I think having a look at different types of uh, barley, there are a lot, obviously a lot of different distilleries, about 130 in Scotland, um, all doing their own thing. And some of them are looking at um, different types of barley. And I think yeah. experimentation is no bad thing. Um, so I think it's great, like bring it, like if somebody wants to experiment with something completely different or an old heritage style of barley, then yeah. fantastic. Let's let's see what you come up with. And then maybe it's something that the whole industry can learn from as well. So I think it's, I think it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Okay, I think it's time. I mean, we've kept Colin, uh, Colin here for long enough without uh, talking about his uh, beloved sanctuary. So uh, <laughs> shall we move on to whiskey number five, um, which is, of course, the Lagerfullen nine-year-old. House Lannister. Good. Do you know what? Good and bad. Because Jamie, I really liked Jamie. He was the, he was a hero in, in the end, really, wasn't he? But um, yeah, not a great house. Which no. um, yeah, they, 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 yeah. quite representative of like a running in that sense. <laughs> yeah, mixed mixed feelings. I think when we saw the bottle, but uh, they're think, of course that they were of course the the sort of royals or yeah. you know the, the old heritage in Lagavulin. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got the Dun- Nuvig Castle overlooks Lagavulin, the house of the Macdonalds, seat of the Lord of the Isles. So it, it made yeah. sense. It was a good link. A lot of the rationale there was when you look at La- the House of Lannister. Um, yeah, they weren't always great, but um, they spent you know decades and centuries building up to being the wealthiest and most powerful sort of house in Game of Thrones. 
And when you look at the heritage of, of Lagavulin and Distiller, you know, they spent a long time and, you know, very carefully building to being one of the most admired and loved and respected whiskies in oh. the world. So, you know, that, that was kind of where we felt those two came together. But I do understand why Colin wasn't entirely chuffed with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Colin, do you want to talk us through this whiskey? So uh, this is the this yeah. is a Lagavulin nine year old. That's what I love that you've bottled it at nine years old mm. because it's such a uh, we don't see a lot of whiskies bottled under the age of ten or even twelve to be honest. So to be bold and just say, hey, do you know what? This is nine years old. There you go. Because obviously your Lagavulin eight is exceptional. Yeah. So love good. that whiskey. It's so yeah. so good. But I think so many people get hung up. Do you know what? we could talk about age statements in a minute. Colin, talk us through the whiskey. This is what people have come for, please. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite unusual. The, the nine-year-old, uh, when we selected the casks for the nine-year-old, Lagavulin, the vast majority of casks we lay down are refills. So Lagavulin 16 um, is all, all refill casks, mix of American and, and European oak, mix of ex-bourbon, ex-sherry. What we did with this nine-year-old it's, it's all ex-bourbon and it's all first fill. So very unusual that we've taken first fill casks that have come straight from the States, filled them with our new make, left it for nine years, and you get this incredible nine-year-old. Um, it's smooth, bags of vanilla, marshmallow, banana. There's I always think there's a big banana note going on with it. And... Uh, but the, the earthiness is there, the smoke, but very, very smooth. I, I, I love it. I, I think this is a brilliant whiskey. Yeah, someone said um, corn of the cob cooked in a barbecue smothered in melted butter. Yeah, absolutely getting that. That's Fantastic. a great tasting note. Yeah. Really good. I love it. I mean, this one really captures the, the sense of, um, you know, House Lannister being the opulent house of Game of Thrones, you know. Um, oh, that's not the one. Uh, Gucci leather bag. It's not just a leather bag, guys. No. It's a Gucci <laughs> leather bag. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. How, how many bags do you smell before you know it's a Gucci one? Um, I'm impressed, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell the difference between all of the high-end labels as well? Because that, yes, I mean, so. that is a talent. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, which, which reminds me, we need to say a happy birthday to uh, somebody who's watching Sean. Happy 30th birthday, mate. Hope you're having a great day and enjoying the tasting as well. Cheers, Sean. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Cheers. Cheers. Um, I, yeah, I'm loving some of these tasting notes coming through. Um, they mm. are wonderful. Yeah, uh, sorry, this one came up earlier, but agree with banana. Lots of banana coming in as well. Is that signature of Lagavulin, Colin, that banana kind of note? Do you know what's funny? Um, we we only ferment for 55 hours. So during fermentation, that's that's it's not overly short but it's certainly not long and that always i know smells a personal thing and that's the great thing about drinking whiskey and company we all smell and taste different things but i always get banana bread smoky banana bread in the turn room when we walk past the washbacks but this nine-year-old is by far um the the strongest i, I smell it and i don't know if it's just mm. the first fill casks you know that big classic vanilla buttery vanilla port just it seems to just tie in with the spirit beautifully and i, I, I just smoky bananas fantastic yeah yeah i love it again coming back to that idea of um whiskey evoking memories that we have really fun ones there's a really <laughs> scott's back again with something really lovely um it reminds me of playing in the pub um his friend's dad owned before it would open and before the smoking <laughs> ban <laughs> <laughs> He has some really specific tasting notes. I'm loving it. <laughs> That's great. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's some. There's some lovely things coming through. Lagavulin for me, like I've always, um, it, I've I've been to Lagavulin quite a few times. Um, I was there when uh, Georgie Crawford, uh, the previous uh, distillery owner, uh, distillery manager for uh, Lagavulin, handed the key over to uh, Colin in a very emotional moment um, at Facial, which is uh, the other festival, which would have been on about now. Would it have started yet, Colin? When was when? It, it, it would have been this weekend. So, mm. this it, weekend. It, it, so uh, yeah, Lagavulin Day would have been this Saturday, as in two yep. days' time. So I, I would day. never, I would never have been on this call if it was happening. We'd be <laughs> running about, we'd be running about mad, Becky. I would have been on the phone to you. Yeah, oh, 
same. I mean, th so the last few years, so I, I was previously editor of scotchwhiskey.com and every year we were up there with a film crew filming uh, Isla Festival. So if you are interested in seeing what the festival was like, then the videos are still around on YouTube. Sadly, scotchwhiskey.com um, closed at the end of last year. But um, so, yeah, I, I, I would have loved to have been up there with you guys and just enjoyed the festival. It's something else. It's just incredible. The amount of people that come to this small island for a week just to drink whiskey and eat like amazing food, amazing oysters and um, see each other and hang out. It's 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 almost indescribable, isn't it, Colin? Because it's just and I knew it as well. Obviously, he, he goes there every yeah, every year yeah. as well. It's, um, yeah, it's, 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 like, it's, a, it's like a gathering of old friends. And the yeah. music's great, and the, like that is a great thing about working on Isla. We all work closely together. We're all very proud on Isla of all the whiskies. So we try and you know I try and slope off to other days as well and enjoy them. So it's uh, a brilliant, brilliant event, and hopefully next year we're we're back to normality. Yeah, <laughs> yeah God, I really hope so. Um, and then we can all come and um, enjoy Isla Festival again with you guys and um, and hang out. I mean, for, for me, like my favourite spot is actually on the south coast, not quite at Lagavulin, but um, just further down the way at Ardbeg. Um, I was always stay at Seaview Cottage, which is um, on uh, the distillery ground. So it used to be distillery manager Mickey Heads's place and uh sitting uh, outside sea view cottage which is literally right on the rocks and having a coffee in the morning as the sun's just coming up was just when it's not raining and windy and pelting you with hailstones it's beautiful <laughs> and just, just sitting there and enjoying that view and just uh, like being surrounded by the distillery which is operating and it's carrying on and it's going it's just uh something else another it's another world um yeah, it's again like some amazing tasting that's coming through on this one. Um, almost like finding an old dusty book in a drawer and blowing the dust uh, away. Georgie Has Crawford it? would love that. Georgie's always mm -hmm. talks about dusty books with Lagavulin. <laughs> I will tell her that came up. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> this one's nice. A full packet of banana chewets melted together in the microwave. Cool. I think people have too much time on their hands if they're doing that. Why <laughs> would you melt them in the microwave? <laughs> I don't really understand, but cool. Yeah, great taste to know. I'm enjoying that, but yeah, I can't escape the banana. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm go I'm just going to put this up, of course. Tabitha, Mrs. Scotch Whiskey oh. As we all do. Uh, we, we all do. Yeah, we all do. Yeah. We all do. It was such a great resource of information, but sadly, these things don't last forever. Um, guys, we've probably got um, time for a couple more questions for Ewan and Colin. So if you have anything you want to ask that we haven't done so far, um, then please put your questions to them because um, this is, as I said, it's the last ever session in the Our Whiskey Virtual Whiskey Festival. Um, this has been such an amazing uh, experience and we've managed to raise so much money as well. So I'm so um, happy to have you all with us. Um, let's finish up with a few really exciting, interesting questions for these guys um, who are gonna be uh, singing us out um, the whole way, the whole thing. Oh, this is a lovely question actually from Sean. Um, what is your go-to whiskey for a night in? We have plenty of those at the moment, so <laughs> what do you go for? God, uh, that's that's a really hard question because it really genuinely depends on my mood. Um, I Probably the whiskey I turn to the most often is actually Johnny Walker Black Label. And the reason for me is that no matter what mood I'm in, what taste I want, it'll have that in, it, in there somewhere. Um, we talk a lot about it, sort of representing all four corners of Scotland. And for me, it is genuinely Scotland in a glass. So if you want some of that climbly sweetness, you want some of the, the cardu sort of mellow, sort of Speyside style, you want that Colila smoke, you want um, you know some Glen Kinchy lighter Lola notes, they're all there at play. So whatever mood you're in, it ticks some of those boxes. Um, and if you want it in a highball, you know, it's perfect for that. So that's probably the one I go to the most often. But uh, just because Colin's on that, I do quite like that, a lagging one too. That's <laughs> funny though, you and I've been drinking Black Label a lot recently. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, 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 I do tend to <clears throat> I do tend to drink Black of Woolen. Uh, but but actually, a lot of our distillers editions I, I, I love mm. so. Uh, the Oban and, and Crag and Moore, actually, I've been drinking quite a bit of Crag and Moore and Klein Leash Distillers editions just because <clears throat> they've just been like a, a finished or a second maturation just for a year uh, in, in ex sherry casks. And 
just about the evening <coughs> when the kids have gone to bed and we get a bit of downtime, that's that tends to be my my favourite way to relax. So, mm, yeah. Uh, but, but blends. I'm, honestly, Johnny Walker Black Label. I, I agree. I think there's there's so much going on and a great mix of flavour and taste that it'll yeah. sort you out any mood you're in. I agree. I agree. How do you tend to take your Black Label, guys? Do you have it neat or with ice water? I quite like it. A tall glass ice and quite often ginger beer. Actually, sometimes ginger ale. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 t- I tend to, I tend to drink it just with ice, but I, I do like it as a, as a, a tall drink with with ginger. It's always good. Yeah, absolutely. I, for me, I'm going to go out of Scotland and say I probably. I mean, I, I have a lot of whiskey in the house. The one style of whiskey I never really tend to get sent is bourbon. So I will yeah. always go and buy a bottle of bourbon, and I'm a sucker for something cheap and cheerful like Buffalo Trace or um, Bullet. Or yeah. something like um, Old Forester as well, mm. because they're just um, they're sweet, they're punchy, they're spicy, they're nice lot of fruit to it, uh, and it's just, it's just nice to sort. It's like a hug in a glass. That one, just mm-hmm. just just to have like this lovely bourbon, and it's also great for all the old fashions that I get through as well. So that's a, that's a lovely tasting note, a hug in a glass. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Less a tasting note, more of a feeling, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I suppose. Saying- I was going to say, there's a few folks who are asking about, you know, different whiskeys, recommendations and stuff. Um, this selection of whiskeys we've been tasting tonight, these are, um, they were a limited run, but they are still available for sale on shop.malts.com. So if you did like one of them or all of them, you can still get your hands on these. Just wanted to yeah. let people know that. I will be putting uh, links to uh, where you can purchase all these whiskeys in the comments on uh, every platform. So whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube um, or even Twitter, I'll be putting some links out there. So um, you'll be able to uh, find these whiskeys and track them down. Um, I've seen already there's been uh, a couple of purchases made already. I love, um, I, yeah, I know um, I'm trying to find the comment now. Um, earlier we had uh, Dom Paris who said that he ran out straight away and uh, well, he was going to buy it after the event, but he's already bought a bottle of Vitalisca, which is great. Oh, so I'm nice. glad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and anyone else, if, if you're thinking of purchasing a whiskey, then then do go for it because, you know, these are great whiskeys. They're still available. Snap them up now because they're once they're gone, they're gone. You're in. They're, this isn't like an existing yeah. ongoing range, right? So correct, once yeah. they've, sold out, they've sold out. So, um, please, yeah, please go ahead. Here we go. Here's Dom. Already bought, ordered a bottle of Vitalisca, which is lovely. Wonderful. Um, here's um, a lovely comment in from uh, Tarita Mullings. Uh, question for you, and please tell everyone about your Boulevardier cocktail. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to know about this now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I'm a huge fan of a Negroni, and I've been playing around with making Negronis um, using whiskey because a, a whiskey Negroni is basically a Boulevardier, and I've been playing around with a variety of different drams to try and make the perfect one. And I'm not sure I've quite stuck on it yet, but I'll get there. I'll keep you posted. And like, here's here's probably one last question we've got from someone who uh, is obviously really inspired by the whiskey that you've been talking about today. Um, So let's go back to Dom and he's asked, what whiskey would you give to a friend who doesn't drink whiskey to introduce them? Which is, I think, a really interesting question. Hmm. Um, It's quite tricky because there's never a right or, or really a wrong answer to this. For me, it's about having that conversation about what kind of flavours they enjoy, first of all, because the assumptions often that someone drinks whiskey, so you give them the lightest, most delicate whiskey you can find. But actually, if someone loves big, bold red wines, they drink espressos, you know, they might actually appreciate something with a bit more body and weight to it. So it's for me, it's all about having that that initial conversation about what flavours they like, and then trying to pair one to, to that. Um, one of the whiskies I work for a lot is um, Hay Club, which is a single grain Scotch whiskey rather than single malt. And we kind of touched on them earlier. They're a little bit lighter, a little bit gentler, more smooth in style. And I do find that those tend to perform well with people who are who are quite new to Scotch whiskey because it's very mixable as well. Mm. I think I, I, I completely agree with you there. There is, there's this perception that um, if you're new to whiskey, then you definitely won't like peated whiskey. Um, particularly if you're a woman who's new to whiskey, you're always steered away from the Lagavulin, which makes no sense because a lot of my friends who are new to whiskey bloody love it, but they yeah. won't go near the the light, fruity, floral style of whiskey that people expect them to like. So yeah. everyone has their own tastes and their own personality. So I think it's just, it's always a question of, 
try everything just try different bits and pieces and um, give them a bunch of different whiskies to, to taste and see what their, their preference is or as you said um what do you like already take your cues from that so then what type of whiskey what style of whiskey will you then go on and like um this is actually something that our whiskey will be um working on going forward um soon as well so um see some more from us um guys i'm gonna say thank you so much to both ewan and colin um for joining us today um it's been amazing having you both here with us and uh, I, I speak you. on behalf of everybody who's been watching um thank you so much for all of your questions and for, for answering everything and talking us through these whiskies and um thank you so much for supporting this event becky thank you so much for having yeah. us and thanks for all the work you've done i mean to raise this kind of money and this kind of awareness for the drinks trust is just incredible so well done to you brilliant brilliant thanks Thank becky you. it's been a yeah. pleasure well i hope to see you both soon and have a, a proper sure. dram together another cocktail yeah. in some bar in madrid you in and uh, <laughs> a, da a dance up in uh, like a like yes. a village in fish I'll, I'll have perfected my boulevardier by then yes <laughs> good. Excellent. all right guys thank you so much cheers thanks guys bye cheers bye Oh, that's it. The end of the Our Whiskey Virtual Whiskey Festival. Thank you to everybody who has followed along with us all so far. This has been uh, an amazing four weeks. Uh, tons of whiskies that we've tasted, lots of different personalities that we've had through. So thank you so, so much. If you've enjoyed uh, tasting along with us and you want to see some more, then I'd really love to hear from you because you never know, this uh, might be something that we start doing more on a regular basis. Um, like us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, we're always at Our Whiskey. And if you go to ourwhiskey.com, sign up for our newsletter, you'll be the first people to hear about new developments from us. And Believe me, there are going to be some developments. So if you've enjoyed this and you want to learn more about whiskey going forward, then follow us and uh, we'll love to take you along on the journey with us. For now, thank you so much. I've been Becky Paskin. Um, you've been brilliant. Thank you and uh, cheers. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>